Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Uh, it looks like we have some people still joining, but um, we're going to just go ahead and start with some admin stuff, and then I will let Dr. Song take it away. Um, if you have any questions about how to receive your CME credit for this program, uh, please reach out. You will see our contacts um, on EADS. And um, we will also have this session recorded and available at psoriasis.org. So um, if you need to reference anything back, then you can always find it there. Um, and uh, we'll have a Q&A panel at the end of the, of the lecture. And so if you have any questions, just throw it into the chat and we'll make sure all of your questions get answered. So without further ado, I'm going to give the mic to Dr. Song. Thank you everyone for being here with us. Thank you, Dr. Song, for being here with us. We're so excited. Outstanding. Well, uh, thank you so much. I think I'm getting some kind of background noise there. If you don't mind, if you could just put yourselves on mute. And if you have a question, we'll just maybe have you put it in the chat box and I promise we will get to it at the end. But I'm James Song. I'm a dermatologist in Washington State. And I have the pleasure to speak to you on psoriasis and patients of skin of color. And these are my disclosures. I am a speaker, consultant, and or investigator for uh, many of the products that are approved for psoriasis. I don't think this will be relevant for today's discussion unless you ask me a, an actual question on the product. We do wanna acknowledge that this, um, this program is being provided by the National Psoriasis Foundation. And we also have some educational grants from Bristol Myers Squibb, as well as the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. So thank you to our sponsors. And so here are the objectives. We wanna first understand what the burden of disease is for our patients with psoriasis and, and see, is the burden actually greater in those who have skin of color versus those who are more fairly complected. We also wanna recognize that there are treatment disparities that exist. That's both in access to specialists like dermatologists, but even access to these newer kind of more targeted um, and quite frankly, better medications, whether we're talking about biologics or small molecule inhibitors. And then we're gonna review some of the treatment nuances that we need to keep in mind when we are um, treating patients who have more, uh, more melanin in their skin and then lastly, identify shortcomings with our current treatment guidelines and, and what we can do to address them in the future. So if this patient were to walk into our clinic, right, this is what we call a gimme or a, a doorway diagnosis. That is, you can make the diagnosis from the doorway because it is so obvious, right? Even a medical student that has no interest in dermatology could make this diagnosis, right? Very classic, well-circumscribed plaques, silvery scale, very typical areas like the knees. But what about this patient here? And while psoriasis is certainly a consideration, now we have to expand our differential diagnosis. And that's in part because the, the erythema or that kind of pinkness that clues us in to whether this is psoriasis or not, right? That kind of salmon color pink, it's not that apparent now in skin of color. And it looks more purplish or gray or even hyperpigmented. hyperpigmented. And that can make us start and to consider some, consider some other conditions like like in planus, um, discoid lupus, subcutaneous lupus, mycosis fungoide, sarcoidosis, et cetera. And so this is one of the critical kind of fundamental reasons why there is a disparity in the type of treatments that our skin of color patients get is because of the diagnostic uncertainty. And in fact, we have research to show that even board certified dermatologists like myself, okay, there is still less confidence in diagnosing psoriasis. And so that could contribute to delay in care and more severe disease presentation when we see these patients for the first time. This is another patient with psoriasis of obviously darker skin type. These plaques are much more hyperkeratotic, thicker, and certainly psoriasis, again, is on a differential, but we think about things like hypertrophic lichen planus, hypertrophic discoid lupus, even purigal nodularis. And this is the last patient that I'm going to show you. This is an inverse psoriasis patient where we have it in the axilla and underneath the inframammary folds, but plaques, again, much more purplish gray, much thicker. And so the, the point I'm trying to make here is that this diagnostic uncertainty or discomfort that we have, and partly because our education just doesn't prepare us all that well for treating patients with 
um, darker skin types, this is one of the contributing factors to why there are disparities in care. And this is an area that we need to improve on. So now let's talk about how common psoriasis is in skin of color. The truth is we don't actually know because most of our epidemiologic data is coming from Caucasian patients. And so we see that at least in this cross-sectional survey, Caucasians have over 3%. But when you look at African-Americans and Hispanics, just a little under 2%, but that could be certainly a, a misrepresentation because oftentimes this is underreported. There may be selection bias or inequitable access to care. But I, I think more so than just trying to come up with a number, the point here is that the, the, there's, there's a misconception that psoriasis is, is not common in skin of color, and that is not true at all, right? We're still seeing anywhere from one to 2% of patients glo uh, globally are having psoriasis. Now, what could account for some of these differences in prevalence? Well, environment probably does play a role. We do know that the closer you live to the equator, the less common psoriasis is, and the further you move away, the more common it becomes. We also know that diet can be contributory. So um, cultures where they consume more kind of anti-inflammatory diets, we tend to see psoriasis lessen. And then countries like the US, right, where you have more of a pro-inflammatory diet, that's really where we seem to see the most psoriasis. And this is actually one really well done and kind of fascinating study looking at a mice model of psoriasis. And they fed these mice a, a Western diet, so the SAD diet. And what they found was that they were able to induce or worsen the psoriasis form dermatitis when they actually looked at the amount of what we call gamma delta T cells, which are contributing to psoriasis, they produce a lot more IL-17A. And as some of us know here today, IL-17A is pretty much synonymous with psoriasis. That's the main cytokine that drives the disease. And we also saw changes in the skin, the gut, as well as the joints in these, in these mice that were uh, being fed this Western diet. And then lastly, genetics. We know that there are over 70 now susceptibility genes that have been identified in psoriasis, HLA, CW6 being kind of that classic one. But we know that these alleles are represented in varying degrees in different racial ethnic groups. And that is probably the reason why we're seeing differences in prevalence as well. Now, how does psoriasis look in skin of color? Generally speaking, the subtype and distribution is gonna be similar across all skin types. And so plaque psoriasis is by far the most common. And we expect to see it in the typical areas like the scalp, elbows, knees, inverse area nails. Having said that, there are some studies to suggest that maybe Asian patients are more likely to have this kind of small plaque psoriasis phenotype. And just like the name suggests, these plaques are much thinner, much smaller. I alluded to this before, but the erythema is harder to appreciate in skin of color. And then, and that's problematic because one, it could lead to diagnostic challenges, right? We said the erythema tends to look more purplish gray but also it leads to underestimation of disease severity. As some of you know, one of the components of the PADI score, which is what we use in clinical trials, is, is the erythema. And because we have a tendency to underestimate the severity, we may actually undercall under the severity of the disease. And so when we're being trained doing these PADI scores, oftentimes we are told to overestimate or go one grade up of what you think this patient has based on the color of the skin. We also have one study, at least, and there's several now that have shown this, that skin of color patients, particularly Asians and Black patients, tend to have more extensive body surface area at baseline, which could be in part to a delay in care. Also, and this is more anecdotal, but I think a lot of psoriasis experts would agree that scalp psoriasis tends to be more severe in Black patients, particularly females, which could be a function of uh, the way um, hairstyle practices, how often they're washing their hair. And then this pigmentation is a very important and, and potentially this is more important than the disease itself, right? So that footprint or shadow that's left behind after the psoriasis goes away, okay, could have a tremendous impact on quality of life, right? And when we're talking about treatment options, some could actually worsen that hyperpigmentation. So we need to be aware of that as well. Now, does the impact of psoriasis on quality of life differ amongst racial ethnic groups? We have very limited data. This is one study looking at etanercept, which is a TNF inhibitor in a community-based population. And we're looking at whether there's differences in efficacy amongst racial and ethnic groups. And I want you to look at that histogram on the left-hand side. What we're measuring here is called the DLQI score. So this is the standard way of measuring quality of life. 
from a disease. And so essentially, the higher the score, that means the more impact your disease has on your quality of life. So we want to get those numbers as close to zero as we can. Now, we have four different groups here, Caucasians, African-American, Hispanic, Latino, and Asian. And what we see is that at baseline, before anyone gets treatment, Caucasian patients have the lowest DLQI score, right? So they have the least impact on the quality of life compared to the other racial groups. And then at 12 weeks, when these patients receive a Tanercept, all of these patients, for the most part, improve to the same degree, but still Caucasians have the lowest DLQI score. Okay? And if you look at the right-hand table, we're showing you the absolute DLQI score. So Caucasians, 3.53 on a scale of 30, right, after 12 weeks of a Tanercept. And African-Americans had almost a full point higher. And this is even after you controlled for body surface area and then the physician global assessment score. So essentially what this is saying is that the differences here in quality of life is not because of differences in disease severity. Even if you control for that, we're seeing a higher impact right, in, in black patients. And that could be in part because of hyperpigmentation that we talked about, but there also might be certain cultural uh, perceptions of disease, of having psoriasis that might also affect their quality of life, no matter how much we clear their skin. This is another study measuring disease burden in black patients, but this is coming from now the rheumatology literature, so psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. And what, similar to what we saw in the previous study, African-Americans had the highest baseline body surface area compared to non-black patients. And when you looked at their quality of life that's coming from the skin, it was worse in black patients compared to um, white patients who had similar based on body surface area. But what was interesting was that psoriatic arthritis was pretty much comparable. The quality of life was comparable in black and white patients. So it's something unique to the skin that really seems to impart a greater disease burden. Also, we found that black patients were less likely to receive systemic therapy. So when you look at conventional DMARDs, so these are kind of the older medicines that we use for rheumatic drugs or rheumatic diseases, we see about 28% of white patients got it versus just 8.3% of black patients. But the biggest difference is gonna be the biologics. Just under a half of patients who were white got a biologic, whereas only 13% of black patients got a biologic. So that's a humongous difference here. And then this is, a, this is an area that we need to do further research in because the, the, the reality is, Biologics, cost aside, are the, are the most effective and, quite frankly, the safest medications that we have for psoriatic disease. But there is you know, a, such a large difference here. There's probably other things that are going on here. And we're going to actually try to explore some of those reasons here in the next couple of slides. So the psoriasis patients across racial and ethnic groups receive equal treatment. And you probably know the answer to this, no. So we know there are treatment disparities. Ethnic and racial minorities are undertreated on average and less likely to visit a dermatologist. Black patients, like we saw before, less likely to receive a biologic. And these are a couple of reasons why. Lack of education on the treatment options themselves, right? What is a biologic? That could sound scary to some people unless they're familiar with it. Um, some studies have shown that minority patients are more risk averse and that probably comes from a lack of education on the, on the disease as well as the treatments. Healthcare provider uncertainty in the diagnosis. This is a real thing. And this is an area that we need to improve on at the medical school and residency levels. And then socioeconomic factors, no question, right? If you have state insurance, you're gonna have a harder time not only seeing a dermatologist, but getting one of these newer, fancier biologic or small molecule inhibitors. This is a recent study looking at healthcare utilization in the US from 2001 to 2013, looking at different racial groups. And the punchline here is that if you were a non-Hispanic minority, you were about 40% less likely to be able to see a dermatologist versus a non-Hispanic white. And that amounts to 3 million fewer visits per year amongst non-Hispanic racial minorities. This was another study looking at um, a cross-sectional survey okay, of close to 17,000 patients who have chronic inflammatory skin diseases. And like we've seen consistently now, white patients, versus black and Hispanic patients were more, more likely to see a dermatologist. And then the delay in care was because of these uh, six reasons, many of which shouldn't be a surprise. But what I would like to draw your attention to is that last point, lack of healthcare workforce diversity, right? And so when they asked these patients, right, why they don't see a Dr. So-and-so, now some of the answers were because that doctor, I don't think understands 
uh, my skin type, right? Uh, they don't have the same color as me. And so I don't think they'll understand how to treat the nuances of, of having darker skin tones. And this is an area that we need to improve as well. Now, a couple of slides back, we, we showed you just that, that discrepancy between biologic utilization in black and white patients, right? And this is a study trying to understand why those reasons are, or, or what the reasons are for that. And so this is actually a very well done study out of UPenn looking at, are there racial differences in the perception of biologic therapy? And what they did in the study, they took 68 patients, half were black, half were white. None of them were ever on a systemic agent before, but they had moderate to severe plaque psoriasis. And when they asked these patients, okay, so I'm gonna just throw out a couple of terms like oral therapies or injectable biologics. And I want you to tell me what are the first things that come to mind? In both groups, what we saw was apprehension, side effects and immunosuppression. Okay, so not a surprise, especially for people who've never been on a systemic treatment before. But what was a surprise is that just in the black patient population, they reported unfamiliarity and dislike of needles when they asked them what their thoughts were on a biologic, okay? And so there is something here. And this is a, another study coming from the same group trying to understand why that, uh, that, fam or that lack of familiarity is there amongst black patients. And one thought is maybe the actors or the actresses in these direct to consumer marketing ads, they're made up predominantly of white actors and actresses. And so, a patient of color that sees these commercials may be like, well, yes, I have that disease, but that treatment may not be for me because those patients don't look like me. And so this study looked at the racial makeup of direct consumer marketing for psoriasis in the last couple of years, and not a surprise, right? Over 90% of actors and actresses were white. We're seeing um, much lower numbers for black and Asian patients. Now let's talk about some treatment nuances when it comes to treating skin of color. There is a lower threshold to biopsy. And, and yes, you could have very obvious psoriasis that we don't need to biopsy, which is in large part a clinical diagnosis, but sometimes the hyperpigmentation might obscure some of the findings, right? And so we might need to biopsy these patients to confirm the diagnosis. Also, there's a, sometimes a lower threshold to escalate to a systemic therapy for scalp psoriasis. And that really is because some of the products that we normally would use to treat scalp psoriasis may not be compatible with certain individuals, especially if they style or use certain products in their scalp, or if they're maybe washing their hair just once or twice a week, we can't expect them to use a medicated shampoo you know, once, once a day. And then as mentioned before, post-inflammatory pigmentary changes, this is you know, a really a, a, main, a big thing because hyperpigmentation can happen from the disease, but it can also happen from topical steroid use. And the hyperpigmentation can also happen from the condition, but also worsen with phototherapy, which is one of the most commonly used modalities to treat psoriasis. And as I mentioned, we have to make sure that our, our treatment vehicles will be compatible with the hair care practices. So I can't prescribe someone a greasy ointment or a cream um, for the scalp if it's gonna undo some of the products that they're using, or if a, if a product has a lot of, let's say a high water content and a patient uses heat to straighten the hair, that high water content product could definitely undo some of that. So we need to be aware of what type of products are compatible with what type of hair. Now, phototherapy is very is a commonly used modality, and in certain cultures, having tan skin is desirable. But we can't assume that's the case across or, or, across the world, right? Because in Asian patients in particular, you know, having tan skin is not something they want. In, in fact, fair skin is a sign of beauty. And so, how common is pigmentary alteration and psoriasis. So this study looked at close to 460 patients. And what they found was that post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation was found in over 13% of patients. Hypopigmentation was found in about 10% of patients. And when they're trying to look for risk factors of what type of patients were more likely to get patients who had more uh, color in their skin. So the darker skin type patients had the highest odds ratio. So it's close to four times. And you can see the confidence interval does not cross one. So that is statistically significant. And there was no association found with hypopigmentation. The other risk factor that we saw was past or current phototherapy use. That was associated with PIH. And the odds ratio here is over two. And we did not see this association with any other treatment. So that begs the question, can we alter our phototherapy protocol in skin of color patients to potentially minimize uh, the potential for uh, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation? 
So this is one small study that was actually really nicely done out of Egypt. This looked at 20 patients with psoriasis and they, they were looking at two different uh, phototherapy protocols. And so on the left side of the body, patients received the standard narrowband UVB protocol, which is you're getting 100% of the minimal erythema dose. And then you would kind of escalate as you normally would. Whereas the right side of the body okay, would get the, the modified protocol. We call that the sub erythrogenic dose. So that's just 70% of the minimal erythema dose and they would escalate as tolerated. So each side was kind of serving as its own comparator. And the punchline here is that when you looked at the end of the study, which was 12 weeks, the improvement in the psoriasis, and we're measuring that by percentage of reduction in PASI score, was identical on the right and the left side. It was over 90%. And if you jump down to the bottom table, when you look at the total number of sessions, it was pretty much the same. 40 sessions on the right side, about 40 sessions on the left side. But the biggest difference here was the total cumulative dose at the end of therapy. Patients who got that modified protocol, their total cumulative dose was 42.7 joules per centimeter square versus the left side that got the standard dose, it was 62, so 20 joules higher than their right side. Now, this isn't a perfect proxy as to whether someone's going to hyperpigment, but at least what this is showing and kind of a proof of concept is that we could probably use doses that are lower than we did in the past to treat the psoriasis and potentially lower the risk of post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Now, how generalizable is our clinical trial data to skin of color patients? Well, when you look at randomized controlled trials for in dermatology across many different diseases, what we have found consistently is that psoriasis studies enrolled the lowest amount of non-white participants. And according to this study in the JAMA, it was under 16%. And then when you look at phase three pivotal trials for, for our biologic agents, it ranged anywhere from 67 up to 95% of participants were white. Well, why does that matter? Well, we know that one size does not fit all, and we could even look outside of dermatology for proof. And so this is a study looking at two antihypertensive regimens, isosorbide dinitrate and hydralazine, in patients with advanced congestive heart failure. And what they found was that there was a unique survival benefit in African-American patients, which is why the FDA approved this regimen specifically for this patient population. What about diuretics? Okay. Chlorothaldone, not something that's typically used, but for black patients seems to be better at reducing blood pressure and strokes than lisinopril in African-Americans. We've also seen that clinical response rates can differ whether it's efficacy and safety to some of our old, older conventional therapies like methotrexate, cyclosporin and acetrin, and that can be diff, uh, that could depend on your on your genetic makeup. So we do see what we call single nucleotide polymorphisms, which are differences in these genes that can metabolize these medications. And we've also identified genetic polymorphisms that can predict response to TNF and IL-12 and 23 inhibitors. So not everyone is the same. So do we have data then in psoriasis to show that there are differences in efficacy and safety amongst racial groups? It's very limited. So this is one study, this is looking at bradolumab. This is an IL-17 receptor inhibitor, and this is coming from their pivotal trials. And I would direct your attention to that bottom half here. We're looking at four different efficacy endpoints, PGA-01, PASI-75, 90, and 100. We got four different racial groups. And what you're seeing pretty consistently is that across all four endpoints, each of the racial groups did about the same. So there wasn't an appreciable difference. So that's good. And this is another study. This is an antenna step study looking at the mean change in the body surface area across those four racial groups. And kind of like we saw with the previous slide, across all, uh, all four groups, the response rates are pretty similar to a tanercept. However, when you look at adalumumab, also known as Humira, this is a TNF inhibitor, and you look at their pivotal trials for moderate to severe plaque psoriasis, white patients on average did about 9% better than non-white patients, right? So that delta of 9% is actually not insignificant. And when you looked at the pivotal trial for secukinumab, that's an IL-17A inhibitor for moderate to severe plaque psoriasis, you can see there were actually quite a stark difference between Hispanic and non-Hispanic patients. And I kind of just wrote out the differences here. So anywhere from 7 to 12% difference amongst these subgroups, depending on the endpoint. And when you looked at Asian patients, and this is a review looking at the efficacy and safety of biologic and small molecule inhibitors for psoriasis, we found that Asian patients are generally lighter, not a surprise, up to 20 kilograms lighter than Caucasian patients. 
Asian patients tend to have a higher baseline severity, and we saw superior efficacy amongst all the IL-17 inhibitors, secukinumab, berdolumab, and ixikizumab, as well as tofacitinib, which is a JAK inhibitor in Japanese patients compared to Caucasian patients. And that could be in part because of the weight. We know that generally lighter patients are easier to treat. But what was interesting is that there's a higher rate of TB with infliximab, which is a TNF inhibitor in Chinese patients. And that shouldn't come as a surprise because TB is endemic in those areas. But we also saw a higher rate of shingles in Japanese patients who are treated with tofacitinib. And we saw this pretty consistently with all the JAG inhibitors. There's something about Eastern Asian patients that seem to increase their risk for some of these adverse events. So lastly, what are we doing now to address these disparities? Well, there is a concerted effort now amongst, amongst all of us really to diversify our clinical trials. And that can mean doing dedicated studies for skin of color patients for certain therapies and different diseases, but also being very intentional about the sites that we pick to do these clinical trials and making sure that the investigators could actually recruit a, a much more diverse patient population. And this is one example of a dedicated study in the skin of color population. So this is Gaselkumab, an IL-23 inhibitor that's approved for moderate to severe plaque psoriasis. And this is looking at 200 participants that have at least a skin type four, five, and six. So I think this is gonna be really helpful in helping us understand the efficacy and safety of this medicine in skin of color patients. And we also have some wonderful societies like the Skin of Color Society that's really just done such great work in advancing um, this movement, as well as making sure that we're educating our peers uh, on how to uh, diagnose and treat skin of color patients. And then even companies like Visual DX that have dedicated photo galleries now um, of patients of skin of color in different diseases to really help equip our medical students and residents and even doctors to get more comfortable with, with diagnosing skin of color patients. And with that, just, just my last kind of conclusion remarks here, First off, while psoriasis may not be as, as common um, in, in skin of color patients as you see in Caucasians, it still is not uncommon. And the disease severity and the impact on quality of life is often greater. Patients of skin of color are often undertreated with limited access to care and some of our more advanced therapies. And optimal treatment requires understanding nuances of skin of color, including vehicle selection and how to address the post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation and the treatment responses may differ across racial ethnic groups. This is an area that we need more research in. And currently we do have a paucity of clinical trial data on skin of color patients, but I am confident that we are heading in the right direction in this regard. So with that, I thank you so much for your attention and time. If you have any questions, this is my email address here. And if you're interested in more CME programs, we have a, really a great library uh, of resources by, from um, world leading experts in, in psoriasis that you could access at this website here. And also we have the National Psoriasis Foundation Grand Rounds. You could just scan this QR code and you have world experts kind of talking regularly on different uh, topics of psoriasis. So with that, thank you again. And I'd be happy to, uh, to stick around here for a little bit to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Song. So yeah, feel free everyone to Thank you all for joining and feel free to send any questions in the chat. I see one just came through um, or just unmute and, and go ahead and ask um, Dr. Song. Sure, I could unmute uh, if you want to. <laughs> oh, perfect, go ahead. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, hi, Dr. Song, nice to see you. Uh, so yeah, great presentation. Uh, so I, the question I had is that I know biologics can paradoxically worsen psoriasis. And with that possibility alone, can that increase the rates of apprehension, especially in skin of color, considering the facts of like education and all of that? And uh, what can be done to address that, especially when discussing that to patients? Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's an interesting question. So certainly paradoxical psoriasis has been reported, um, particularly with the TNF alpha class, but it's also been reported much less common in some of the other MOAs like IL-12-23, IL-23, or IL-17 inhibitors. Now, whether that is disproportionately represented in skin to color patients, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I would be surprised if it were. So this is a, a phenomenon that we can see, I would say across all different skin types. So it's not just something we see in skin to color, although that's possible. So I don't really, bring that up proactively, to be honest, just because it's not that common. And I don't want to, 
um, scare these patients any more than they already are because of the apprehension of using a biologic. But certainly, if it were to happen, then you know we can talk about you know what this does happen occasionally, and we have other treatment options that we can use to to get your psoriasis better, even though you flared on a different medicine. That's good to know. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry, I was muted. I also have someone that was asking Dr. Song if you could flash your email again, just. Um... There you go. Thank you so much. Yeah, you bet. Any other questions? Okay, awesome. Um, I'll just make a few more announcements and then if there are no other questions, we'll let you guys go. So we have a few more webinars like this coming up. We have one um, on treatment adherence, one in um, women of childbearing age and one um, on mental health. And so make sure to stay stay tuned on psoriasis.org for CME hyphen library. Um, you can see all of those programs as well as our in-person programs and our podcasts like Dr. Song mentioned. Um, and after this, uh, you will get a, an email from EADS with the post-test and the evaluation. And once you guys fill that out, you'll be automatically sent a CME certificate um, for, for your one credit for this, for this course. So just let us know if you have any other questions. And um, I guess if there are no other questions, we can end it here. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Song. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Song. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thanks.